question mark at the end. Uh, simply because uh, the role of the public intellectual has to assume that one a public exists and such a thing as intellectual activity is uh, possible, uh, which I think is in some ways questionable given the nature of cultural commodification. Um, also to clarify, I know Frank raised it already, but I'm not presenting this as a public intellectual. In fact, I don't see myself as a public intellectual. I don't think I'm engaged enough uh, with the public. Uh, I think others might have a claim to that more, maybe like Larry Bowie or someone like that. Uh, uh, Gordon Laxer, the head of the Parkland Institute. Uh, I think it's really rare uh, public intellectual in the first place. Uh, so uh, I think it's quite a difficult task at that. And so for me it was, the, the key question was centering around uh, the role and the relationship of uh, intellectuals to truth, uh, which I would call big T truth. And the whole relationship between uh, heart and head, and with the intellectual side being of the head. Uh, I pulled a, a quote out that, I, that reminded me right away of, of this kind of discussion. It was, comes back from when Adlai Stevenson was the uh, Democratic candidate running against Dwight D. Eisenhower uh, in the 1956 presidential election. A woman shouted out to him, Senator, you have the vote of every thinking person. And he shouted back to her, that's not enough, madam. We need a majority. <laughs> so just the idea that, uh, you know, this idea that somehow uh, eggheads and people who think intellectually use logic is, is kind of a, a dominating norm in society and that what we need is more from the heart. I, I thought this is an interesting thesis because uh, it also raises Gramsci's question of the head and the heart and the head being for him the, the party and the heart being the movement. Uh, but I would think, if we have to also think there's a, a, a strange relationship between intellectuals and democracy, and democracy has not been kind to either the intellect or to intellectuals, if you uh, think of Socrates, for example. Uh, what I did, I did a brief survey of the Myers-Briggs personality typing, because uh, I was just wondering about percentages. And on late 1990 statistics, uh, it was very interesting to see that if we divided people what might be called the core capacity to be able to intellectualize in the world, either intuitively or uh, through logic, we come up with a percentage of about 10 to 15 percent, conservatively, um, maybe as low as 5 to 10 percent of the population is capable of intellectual thought. Um, you might question them, well, what is that, right? But interesting, if we go at best to say a quarter of the population was that way in the U.S. at the end of the 1990s. Uh, whereas three quarters of the population, when we break them down, uh, can't see patterns at all. And their, and, their, and their primary way of making judgments is through emotion. So it's not unusual then to see why the right has argued that the only kind of education that's good for the masses is religion. Now, um, there are other ways to look at that, of course, and we could identify certain people who have been able to break through that. I think in terms of the Americans, I think Noam Chomsky would probably be the leading sense of an intellectual, even though he had very little public space. And I think the, the increasing changes in the technology uh, in the world may be opening up new spaces, but I think for the most part, we'd have to say that public intellectuality, at least in North America, has been in decline. The um, question that we've asked for today and I think the second qu two questions are, what does it mean to go public, and what is an intellectual? So I'm not going to focus on the first question, if you read my PhD thesis if you so dare, on that topic. I want to focus more on this notion of uh, intellectual practice, praxis, or thinking through logically, uh, rationally, intuitively, uh, at the same time as linking it to some kind of politics. My main interest here is primarily on the relationship of anti-intellectualism to anti-hegemonic intellectualism. That is primarily uh, the complicity of what Badu calls sophists, romantics, and postmodernists in facilitating anti-intellectualism in particular, and they have undermined critical and counter-hegemonic intellectualism at the core, and the core centers on a defense of what Edward Said called speaking truth to power. So the ideas that I draw on here draw from people like Said, like Gramsci, like Slavoj Žižek, Frederick Jameson, 
Jürgen Habermas, but primarily I focus on the work of Alain Badu, because that's who I'm reading right now. In terms of this, going back to the, the Myers-Briggs Jungian personality type stats, intellectual persons are a small minority, and anti-intellectualism is by far the dominant temperament. This is consistent with the historian Richard Hofstadter's long-standing thesis that the dominant intellectual tradition in America is anti-intellectualism. Not good news when his primary political cultural thesis for America was that it is deeply paranoid and delusional on top of that. And I think we can see a case in point of that today. This deep culture might also explain the popularity and power of Oprah Winfrey's fuzzy liberalism and Fox TV's conservative know nothing everything, Bill O'Reilly and Glenn Beck, and radio echo chamber Rush Limbaugh. So when we're talking about public intellectuals, it's important also to remember we're talking also about hegemonic intellectuals, co-opted intellectuals or professional intellectuals, as Macri was talking about, who were co-opted into the system, not just critical and counter-hegemonic or anti-hegemonic intellectuals. According to Gramsci, his definition of intellectuals in his gender time, but I think he was speaking in a humanist sense, all men are intellectuals, therefore one could say, but not all men have in society the function of intellectuals. So I think this is an important issue that, that yes, while we have the capacity, we don't all function as intellectuals. Um, the key think, person we think of as the public intellectual would be Jean-Paul Sartre, this idea of the universal uh, speaker uh, who has a truth. But then Michel Foucault spoke about kind of the end of the universal public intellectual, and, and he promoted the idea of a specific institutional intellectual. It started m small projects, work with small groups. It was so interesting about Foucault is that after the death of Sartre, he became in fact what you might call the globally leading intellectual uh, whose, whose acts and his works were treated in universal, objective, and absolute claims about the notion of power and how it functions. Uh, I think if you think about how that concept of his concept of power functions, it's taken as it came from God. Well, maybe it did come from God, but that raises a very uh, difficult question. Edward Said, in Representations of the Intellectual, highlights speaking a truth that is true in the big T sense, yet based on a deeper sense of healthy skepticism that it will ultimately fail, that our gods will ultimately fail, but we still have to hold to them. And he says, keeping in mind also that the secular intellectual's role to speak the truth of humanity with the big H, in all its multiplicity, and not one's own tribe or self-interested community is a very important part of the project. Um, uh, I don't have time to go through all of it, but I want to identify it.